The first sundials appeared in ancient Egypt, where they developed into two broad categories monumental and portable. The first known portable sundial dates from about 1500 BC. The length of a shadow cast by an index on a horizontal rule gave a morning time and, when the instrument was turned round, the afternoon time. The first monumental sundials consisted of large obelisks. From the direction and length of a shadow cast on the ground, one could determine the time of day. Ancient Greece and the Roman Empire saw the development of ordinary sundials, which also functioned on the principle of a cast shadow. The time of day is indicated by the shadow of a style, or gnomon, that touches the hour lines drawn inside a spherical surface, or on a horizontal or vertical plate. With the revival of projection studies, the Renaissance produced sundials in more curious shapes. Goblet, octahedron, dodecahedron, and cylinder. The style that cast the shadow was shaped like a pin, a flag, or triangle. In some pocket sundials, the style consisted of a wire stretched between the lid and the base. A small compass enabled the user to point the device quickly in the right direction. New monumental sundials were installed in the main cathedrals. Small holes were made in the facade, through the roof, or in the dome to project a sunbeam on a meridian line drawn on the floor. The light ray fell at the center of a line at noon exactly. This made it possible to reset mechanical clocks, whose precision was no match for astronomical clocks. Ever since the Hellenistic period, instruments were built based on the principle of a rod, known as a style, casting a shadow on a quadrant. Such instruments, called sundials, combine two notions. First, the sun as a timekeeper revolving around the immobile Earth in a uniform daily motion. Second, the geometrical analysis of the projection of the style's shadow on surfaces inclined at different angles. In the simplest sundial model, a vertical style is set in a horizontal quadrant. Three curves indicate the daily paths of the edge of a shadow on specific days of a year. The curve farthest from a style denotes the path at the winter solstice when the sun moves at the lowest altitude above the horizon. The intermediate curve shows the path at the spring equinox and fall equinox, when day and night are of equal length. The curve nearest the style marks the path at the summer solstice, when the sun travels highest above the horizon. A second series of lines divides the three curves into sections that, while uneven, are covered by the edge of a shadow in one hour each. On the morning of any given day, the shadow appears to tilt westward. For the first six hours of a day, the shadow steadily shortens, reaching its minimum length at midday. It then lengthens in the following six hours until disappearing eastward at sunset. From a careful observation of a shadow cast on a sundial quadrant, we can therefore determine not only the time of day, but also the time of year. Well known since antiquity, the sundial is an instrument made up by a style casting a shadow on a quadrant variously shaped and inclined. Its functioning is based on the observation of the style's shadow combined with the notion of the sun as a timekeeper, apparently revolving around the immobile earth in a uniform daily motion. The sundial of the Museo Galileo is made up by a large quadrant traced on the pavement and a huge bronze stele, functioning as a gnomon. This sundial was built in 2007, according to the design by Luis Schnabel and Filippo Camarota, with a contribution by Ente Casa di Risparmio di Firenze.
It has been restored in 2015 thanks to the generous support provided by Officine Panerai. Three curves indicate the daily paths of the edge of the shadow on certain days of the year. The curve farthest from the stele marks the path at the winter solstice when the sun moves at the lowest altitude above the horizon. The intermediate curve shows the path at the spring equinox and fall equinox, when day and night are of equal length. The curve nearest to the stele marks the path at the summer solstice when the sun travels highest above the horizon. A second series of lines divides the three curves into uneven sections that are covered by the edge of the shadow in one hour each. At morning, the shadow appears to tilt westward. During the first six hours of the day, the shadow increasingly shortens, reaching its minimum length at midday. It then lengthens in the following six hours until disappearing eastward at sunset. From a careful observation of the shadow cast on the quadrant, we can therefore know not only the time of day, but also the time of year. Date and time are shown by the shadow of the glass globe atop the large bronze gnomon. The hours from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. are marked out by radial brass lines, while the date is indicated by the travertine transversal lines which mark the sun's diurnal course for various periods of the year, exactly when the sun enters the signs of the zodiac. The shadow cast by the gnomon changes in length during the course of the days and seasons. It indicates the true solar time of the place, which is different from the time indicated by wristwatches. This last is known as the mean time. In respect to true solar time, mean time has a periodic variation that can exceed a quarter of an hour during the course of the year. The difference between the regular time indicated by wristwatches and the variable time shown by the sundials is known as equation of time. The difference, given in minutes, is reported by a diagram showing the position of the sun during the course of the year measured at the same mean time. The curve described in the sky by the position of the sun at the same mean time is called analema or lemniscata. During daylight saving time in spring and summer, the difference between true and mean time must consider the setting of clocks one hour forward. For example, in February, the sundial would indicate true midday around 12.28 p.m., while in July, during daylight saving time, around 13.20 p.m. To read the hour and date, you have to identify the hour lines and the calendrical lines closest to the gnomon's shadow. When the shadow does not fall exactly on the hour line, you can read the half hour and quarter hour with close approximation, ideally subdividing the space between two hour lines in two or four parts. The date can also be read by referring to the zodiac signs at the start of the months marked out along the meridian line. The gnomon is made up by two large bronze stelae that symbolize the day and night. The stele representing the day, facing south towards the Arno River, contains a vertical meridian line on which the shadow cast by the tail of a lizyper, half lizard, half viper, indicate midday for each period of the year. The stele representing the night, facing north, shows the representation of the two constellations that allow to identify the pole star, the Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. The wind rose, placed at the base of the gnomon, shows the directions for geographic orientation. After the sunset, the sundial continues to act as an attractive urban element thanks to the lighting underneath the base of the gnomon and the zodiac signs.